So greetings everyone and thank you uh, again for having me to deliver this lecture. This is a topic that I enjoy speaking on and especially speaking to artists and let's say arts entrepreneurs who are really hoping to make their way in the art world. I hope this lecture is going to be useful to you. In general what I am going to be trying to lay out in the course of this lecture is how does the art market work on a global level? How does it function? What are its structures? What are its levels of prestige and power? And most importantly, where can you make your impact? How can you break into it? So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So to start, let me start with a little diagram. These are actually words I use in my book. Art world, art business, art market. And there's a way to understand them. Art world is everything that has to do with art. That's you and your mother having a conversation about Monet. That's part of the art world. Everything that everyone does to deal with art is part of this huge amorphous thing we call the art world. It is the activity of amateurs and professionals. And a more discreet term is the art business. The art business is the activity of professionals in the art market and the clients they deal with. Now, within that, there's really two sections to the art world. There's an art market, which is the exchange of ownership of art objects. To better understand that, let me show you another distinction. In the art business, there are two kinds of consumption to use an economist's term. One, there is experiential consumption, and the other, oh, this is on timed, hold on, go back. Uh, there's experiential consumption, and there's ownership consumption. Ownership consumption is really what we're talking about with the art market, where ownership is exchanged from one party to another party, the ownership of an object changes hands. The other side is experiential consumption. We used to think of that largely as the museum sector. Museums are not selling you their artworks. They are selling you a ticket to come in and experience their artworks to look at them. And this generally had been a nonprofit, or especially in Europe, more of a government state-run facility, not for the private market. But we are now seeing, and that's the picture I show you there, there is an institution in Santa Fe, New Mexico, but also now Denver and Las Vegas, called Meow Wolf, one of the biggest new things to appear in the art world, which is a private art experience. So they are a private company that sells you this ticket to come in and experience this massive entire art installation. But it's an experience. You don't own the experience. And those are the two distinctions. So when we're talking about the art market, we're talking about the exchange of ownership of artworks. Now, what is the art market? And this is a more complex term than you realize. When people think of the art market, first and foremost, they think about paintings. It's like the default idea of an art object that is bought and sold, paintings. And to this day, it makes up a very, very large proportion of the art market. But that said, there's a lot more to it also. 
First of all, let's call them graphics. Uh, anything that can be mechanically reproduced. Things like lithographs, prints, for that matter, photographs. Things where they are not unique. And they have their own dynamics because they are not unique. They are reproducible, sometimes like digital photographs, infinitely reproducible. In which case there is their own problematic because if there is one thing that the art market is based on, it is based on rarity. In other words, a shortage of this object with many collectors competing for it. And this is always a problem with the graphics, the reproducible, printable works. How do you maintain the concept of rarity? You number your prints. Or as a photographer, you say, I'm only printing five. But again, these are complicated. Within that field, we also have drawings. Drawings themselves are often preparatory works. They weren't meant to be the finished product. But for a famous artist, this is, for example, drawing by Klimt. If an artist is famous enough, even their preparatory works, their works that they made to prepare for a painting, take on their own value themselves. Then we get into this field. Let's call it applied arts. We often call it decorative arts. We often call it industrial arts. We often call it design. But with applied arts, they're different from, let's say, the fine arts is the term that we usually use for like paintings. Decorative arts, applied arts, as I will generally refer to them, are objects that are useful and beautiful. And they are valued on their ability to be both. So that, for example, is the massive trade in rugs, woven carpets, all of those textiles that come especially from the regions of the historic carpet producing regions of like Turkey, Persia, uh, Afghanistan, China, Central Asia, where historically carpets have been produced and are themselves very valuable artworks. Belarus. Belarus too, yes. This whole, in fact, this whole region has its fields of woven textiles that are in themselves become art objects. They had function. They form, they form, for example, tapestries, wall coverings, but they have function. And then all of these other industrial arts, glass, glass which can be functional and glass which can be entirely decorative, lighting, chandeliers, uh, all uh, candelabras, all manner of lighting and both electrical or candle lit is its own importance. And of course, a massive sector that we call ceramics, which includes stoneware, terracotta, porcelain, uh, raku, all of these different forms of ceramics. Again, some of which were very functional, and some of which were not so functional. But we have massive sector of ceramics that get traded on these same ideals. And then we have metalwork, which is just a huge category of objects made from different metals, whether it's silver or pewter or gold or mixtures of all of those, including precious stones. Uh, these become essentially vast sectors. Within that, I could include vast sectors of jewelry. Then we get into the mechanical arts. Clocks were one of the first ones. Timepieces in general, uh, whether that's Swiss watches, uh, large clocks that we call long case clocks, or people in America call grandfather clocks, but highly decorative clocks. One of the things you'll notice about these mechanical arts, there will be a great emphasis in what we call integrity. Meaning that, okay, the wood is all there and nice, yes. But are the mechanical parts the original ones? Or have they been replaced? Has it been fixed? And there's a great emphasis on the value with anything mechanical that the parts are original. 
And if they're not original, then they've been replaced by period parts that are correct to the period, not some modern variation. This matters again, especially with weapons. Weapons is a huge trade within the antiques sector, whether that's like hand melee weapons like swords, or whether it's a vast trade in antique firearms, with again the same emphasis on integrity. And of course we have sculpture, which is, can be composed of bronze and stone, marble, and all of them both serving this visual function, often very large, uh, often public statuary, and how they also at the same time uh, are also sometimes very reproducible, especially with bronze casting, and others where they're quite unique, like with marble carvings. And let's not forget about books themselves. Books were one of the early trades that really defined the art market. For example, the famous auction house that we call Sotheby's. They began in the 18th century, primarily an auction house that auctioned books. Now remember, these are books that are like an art object. In other words, you don't buy them and pay a high price for them because you want to read the text in them. The text is probably available in a newer version, far more legible and easy to read and far less fragile. You're buying them because the book is an art object, an artifact in and of itself. Its age, its original uh, bindings, its original features, any inscriptions, all of these things giving rarity. And lastly, let's not forget about the massive sector of the antiques, applied arts sector. We often call them antiques, meaning specifically antique furniture. And this is basically any furniture from periods over about 50 years old. Less than 50 years, we tend to call it vintage. Uh, but it also has its own distinct nomenclature, how we name them. If you notice, furniture is not generally known. The maker, we have a few famous makers of furniture, but generally most of the time we don't know the name of the maker. But we give them names usually based on the monarch at that time, we presume. So for example, this style of chest of drawers here, commode, we would call it uh, Louis the Fifteenth, or if you're really snobbish, we'll call it Louis XV, um, because it's in the style of the French king Louis the Fifteenth's furniture, very rococo. Uh, it doesn't mean it was actually made during his reign. It doesn't mean it was made in France, but we would call it Louis the Fifteenth style. We also find that these styles always get reproduced. So there's second period and third period. So this piece could be from the 1750s. It could also be from the 1850s, long after Louis XV is dead. But this is a common feature of furniture that the style comes back, often about 100 years later. It comes back again and again. And purists will value if it's really from the first period. Is it really from the period of Louis XV? Or is it a 19th century copy of the style of Louis XV? But increasingly, few people care that much about it. So these are all the things that basically are traded by the rules of the art market. Preference for rarity. Uh, preference for integrity. And preference for coming from an esteemed master. But there's a lot of other things that are traded on the same rules of the art market. Most importantly, memorabilia. What's memorabilia? Anyone from the audience? What do I mean by that? Memorabilia. Perfect, exactly. This is a basic Fender guitar. Not important in and of itself. It is important because Jimi Hendrix played it. 
That's why it's important. The key feature of memorabilia is it is relatively ordinary objects made important by their usage and who used them. So we have that in both entertainment, so this can be like the musical instruments, uh, costumes, so costumes that were worn in important movies, uh, again, the same thing we have with sports. Sports memorabilia, uh, again, ordinary baseball glove made special because it was used by a famous baseball player. And that's what makes it famous. So the usage. We can use that, also use an art world term to teach you provenance. Provenance, French word, meaning the history of an object, where it has been, who has owned it, where it has been shown, what has been done with it, its usage, but particularly its ownership and its usage. So with memorabilia, sports, entertainment memorabilia, the provenance is basically everything. Without that provenance, it's not particularly valuable. And this can be also very difficult to prove because uh, generally we have no way to test whether somebody's claim that this baseball was used by this player at this important moment except your claims that it was. For that matter, we also collect political memorabilia that uh, relates to especially to political campaigns. And here's another one that also is traded like the art object, which are automobiles. Now, these are automobiles that generally no longer are the optimal object for usage. In other words, this car, yes, it can drive you to your workplace. Can you buy a new one that will do that better for less money and more reliably? Yes. So then why do you own this car? You own it essentially as an art object. And again, the same importance on original parts, integrity, matter there. Now the next one is really weird. Collectibles. Collectibles, what are collectibles? They are generally consumer products basic products. Often they are toys, action figures, for example, Star Wars action figures. Uh, if any of you, I usually when I ask this to like students, they remember the movie Toy Story 2. And in Toy Story 2, the bad guy is the old prospector. Now why is, what is strange about the old prospector and why he can't move well? Because he's in the box. He is still in his box, which is a priority to collectible collectors. They want, especially toys, that have literally not been taken out of the box. They have never been used, ever. And there's a big priority on it. This was one that was very popular called um, uh, cabbage Patch Dolls, and they were collected again, and now people collect them in large numbers, and they hold on to them, and collectibles are a very large feature of essentially things that function like the art market. And of course, you've probably seen these. These are, of course, the recent phenomenon of like, well, it's now probably six years old that it got big. We call them NFTs, non-fungible tokens which was essentially an attempt to reproduce the phenomenon of rarity within digital, infinitely reproducible objects, digital artworks, and to create that sense of rarity by making them non-fungible, in other words, unique, and then selling ownership of them. Uh, it's sort of maybe run its course, but it still continues to be something we're talking about. Now, those are all the things, a short list of all the things that are traded in the art market or by the rules of the art market. 
Now let's talk about the prime movers of the art market, the collector. These are the people who make it all happen. Without a collector, there's no art market. And in fact, even now, from a psychological perspective, we can't really explain why people collect. It almost defies explanation. Why they have this obsession with owning what is rare and what can rarely be acquired. Uh, this is one of the great collectors in the United States. His name was Dr. Albert C. Barnes. He invented a drug that made him very rich and then proceeded to build an incredible art collection which he collected uh, and it can be seen in the city of Philadelphia. It's one of the great private collections anywhere in the United States. It includes, uh, for example, it includes like 69 paintings by Paul Cezanne. Now, Paul Cezanne was an artist who was recognized very late. Very few museums realized how important Cezanne was going to be. Most museums in America would be happy if they have four or five paintings by Cezanne. They'd be like, wow, that's great. We got like five Cezannes. Barnes has 69. No one else collected Cezanne like he did. And he also built a very unique style of collecting and his house was a museum in itself. Uh, you can visit it now in Philadelphia. He had great collections, not just of Cezanne, but uh, Renoir, many other modernists. And also he collected things, for example, like uh, traditional farm implements. And he would arrange them in a way that were almost artistically arranged along with the paintings. But he was, let's say, a comprehensive collector. Someone who bought the best of everything the best paintings, the best furniture, all the best furnishings, and compare that with what are often our collectors who are, let's say, focused collectors. They may not have a whole lot of... Their furniture might be from Ikea. Their, you know, carpets are machine-made. But they have a great collection of Hummel figurines. Okay, this is the German ceramics brand called Hummel that make these little figurines. So a lot of collectors are just very focused. They just collect one kind of thing and they focus on that. And we have both kind of collectors. Both of them are dynamic drivers within the art market. Now, how big is the art market in general? Okay, so here's some research I did. This was published a few years ago. This was done for the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, measuring the U.S. art and design market. So we made no distinction between fine art and applied arts. Therefore, we called it art and design. And we went through all these different categories of employees, uh, curators, conservators, fine artists, multimedia artists, all other. These are, by the way, government data statistics categories, so that's why we use them. Photographers, non-commercial, art dealers, antique dealers, auctioneers, uh, and then also all of these applied artists, craft artists, fashion designers, interior designers, furniture makers, furniture restorers, craft jewelry makers, ceramists, glass artists, and metal artists, and then what we called commercial art market because we made no distinction whether if you were making art, if it was as a graphic designer at an advertising agency or whether it was a fine artist making a painting, we made no distinction. If you were making art and being paid for it, we said it's the art and design market. So that included art directors, commercial photographers, graphic designers. And what we found were, in the United States, approximately 458,000, approximately about half a million people. Half a million people were employed. Uh, sorry, no, the total, that's half a million people were in the, I'll come to the grand total in a second. Um, so, uh, in terms of, hold on, I, I give you all of this. The total, yeah, 1.5 million. So one million five hundred thousand people are employed in the arts business in the United States. In, in terms of industries, using the same basic industries to measure sales, we came to the uh, number that the total sales in the United States in 2018 was 83 billion dollars. Okay, in all these sectors. So it tells you that there's a lot. We also measured all of the galleries within the United States 
and we found that in New York there were approximately, and this is really small, but approximately in New York there's 1,040 and in California there's 2,070. So actually even though we think of New York as the center of the art market, California has twice as many galleries. But there are 1,000 galleries in New York, there are 2,000 galleries in California, there were 400 galleries in Colorado, so far more galleries than you realize are out there. Uh, so now let me give you some intellectual distinctions about this uh, idea of art and where does it even begin. Um, let me just uh, say, for example, um, what is art? And that's always a difficult question, right? So when I answer it, um, I make a distinction. Art versus treasure. Treasure is a far older idea. Art, in the way we conceive of it, is a very new one. Treasure is going to be objects that have valuable input material, high levels of craftsmanship, but are basically traded, stolen, or given on the basis of their materials. When does it become art? It becomes art when we attach the primary importance to a knowledge of who made it. And by knowing who made it, giving it its value, that's when it becomes art. So let me just explain how the art market comes into existence. And this happens all over the globe and very recently. We have very few instances of there being an art market or an art world before the present day, most parts of the world, maybe not much more than 200 years ago, did our concept of art in the way I'm using it exist. Now, that didn't mean that I, mean, I teach art history classes. And I can tell you, I teach about things made in Korea 2,000 years ago. I teach about things made in Mesopotamia 4,000 years ago. But it isn't understood as art until its primary value lies in a knowledge of who made it. And that happened rarely in history. The first existence that we really know of there being art in this way is in the period, in the Greek period that we'll call the Hellenistic period. This is the period after Alexander the Great's conquests and then the division of his empire into a series of kingdoms. One of those kingdoms was the kingdom of Pergamum, Bergama. It's a city in western Turkey now, very worth visiting, though its best things are in a museum in Berlin, uh, as that happens. Um, for example, Attalus I and his son, Attalus II. These are our first known art collectors in history. By art collectors, what we mean is they, they sought after objects based on a knowledge of who made them. Why? Because look at the dates of Attalus II, 220 to 138 BC. He was educated in Athens. He was educated in a knowledge of the great artists of the period of the building of the Parthenon. Now the Parthenon would have been built 200 years before him, 250 years before him. What that means is already the Parthenon, the Acropolis, all of those sculptures, they are old to him. And the Greeks had a historical perspective. That's the key here. They wrote already things that were like art history, and he was raised in that, and he knew that, and that again, led him to become this great patron. Right, here's the museum in Berlin where the best things are. Uh, and that's why the second component to art collecting is art history. To have art collecting, you must have art history. Art history, what does that provide you? It provides you with a list, what we can call in cultural sectors a canon. In other words, if you've heard this term before, something being canonical. Meaning that in art history, you either mention artists or you don't mention them. 
uh, for example, when art revived in the Renaissance period after the kind of Dark Ages, Middle Ages, where although we produced, again, we produced art, things we call art now, was not produced along this definition of art. Most of the masters who made things in the Middle Ages, we don't know their names, nor was it particularly important. In the Renaissance, it starts to be important again. And this is because especially we have the author Giorgio Vasari, who wrote The Lives of the Artists, which was a book about the artists who worked in the Renaissance. And to this day, the most famous artists that you would know from the, from the Italian Renaissance, Raffaello, Leonardo, Michelangelo, if you go to Vasari's books, you will find these have the most pages. In fact, the values of all Renaissance artists from Italy almost directly correspond to this day to the amount of pages they occupy in Vasari's books. The same was true back in the ancient times. Uh, the author who Attalus II would have been reading was named Xenocrates. Now, we don't have his book. It's lost. But we have it through a Roman writer, Pliny the Elder. And he gives an art history of the early sculptors, painters of the great Greek period. And this is what's going to be guiding a collector like Attalus II. In other words, the canon has this hierarchy of the mentioned and the unmentioned. And the artists that collectors want to collect are the mentioned. And the much mentioned, the much written about, are the ones they're going to want the most. Art history defines the shopping list of the collectors. Now, we get an art market then that prices based on that. And this would happen again in the Renaissance, the 17th century, for example, in Holland, where we start to get artists who are sought after, and they are sought after because of their rarity and because of the way the canon writes about them. And then these are the other five byproducts of art. So, in other words, you additionally need art museums. Art museums, the oldest one we know of, is on the Acropolis. It's this building that you can see just to the left of uh, the Procopia, which is just to the left. This building is called the Pinocotec, a term we still use. Some museums in Europe are called Pinocotec. Uh, and it was our earliest form of like an art museum. Uh, because the museum, by what it chose to include, much like art history, it's limited. You can only mention a few masters. An art museum can only show a few artworks at a time. But by this act of selection, the public gain this knowledge. What is the most valuable? Well, what I'm seeing is the most valuable. Now, because of the difference in valuations that go with the mentioned and the unmentioned, you see the phenomenon of art faking. Almost immediately, once you have an art market, you will start to see the phenomenon of fakes because of the dramatic differences in valuations. This is one of the most famous forgers in history, Van Megeren. He was the one who famously faked uh, Vermeers, Jan, Johannes Vermeers. Uh, amazing story, a uh, different lecture, I tell you all about the history of art faking and how he faked the whole period of Vermeer. And then we get revaluation. Artworks can go up and down with enormous exchanges, changes in valuation. Uh, this, for example, was, we used to call it the Apollo Belvedere. And it was by the great Greek sculptor Leocados. And it was considered the greatest sculpture in Rome. And people like Goethe would travel to Rome just to see it. Until finally, in the 18th century, they began to realize, oh, this is not the original by Leocados, because the one by Leocados is a bronze. So this actually was, and if you've studied Greek sculpture, 
in some of your art history classes, you will know that most of what you're looking at are Roman copies. We have very, very, very few of the originals. On the upside, this is part of what we call the Parthenon frieze, often referred to just as the Elgin marbles, named for the, the Scottish aristocrat who bought them and took them back to Great Britain, that were carved by Phidias, the sculptor who did all of the marble sculpture on the Parthenon. And for a long time, they were believed to not be the originals, until eventually in the 18th century, they realized they were the originals, and then they became extremely valuable, making their way to the British Museum, where they are today, and much debated whether they will or will not be given back to Greece. Another phenomenon you will see is once you have a concept of art, an evaluation of old masters, you will start to see that now expand over into everything that is old. And there will be a great interest in what we call antiques, applied art objects from older periods that will follow the same trading rules as the art market. Here's a basic rule of the principle of antiques today. Within 50 years, every object, and I mean every object, of human production becomes an antique, valued primarily on its non-functional aesthetic and historic value, not for its original function, which is now probably obsolete. This, by the way, is what I used to do back when I lived in Hungary. We're going through a warehouse. Uh, that, her name is Buzi Nani. She's um, a, a, a Roma gypsy antique dealer and she runs this huge operation, but all the antiques are of, let's say, the peasant variety. So they're like peasant furniture. And as you can see there, there are some of these devices we would call a butter churn, where milk would be put in, and then you put it up and down, and then it would become butter. Now, is the person who's going to buy that use that to make butter? No. They're going to use it as a decorative object in their country house because they like the kind of country peasant aesthetic, but not because of its original function. Same thing, last point about basic rules of the art market are super prices. Nothing else in economics follows this. In the art market, you can have absolutely materially identical objects, like you can go make a painting on a canvas with oil paints of sunflowers, and maybe I'll give you $10 for it, but if it's by Vincent van Gogh, we'll give you $100 million. Same canvas, same amount of paint, it's basically very similar looking. All difference in price is based on a knowledge of who made it. Same thing, you can take a cow, put it in a box in formaldehyde like this, and Damien Hirst got like $10 million for it, but we won't give you any money at all for it because you're not Damien Hirst and you didn't do it when he did it. This is something that doesn't really exist anywhere else in economics. Materially, nearly identical objects done with the same craftsmanship, the same quality, but the difference is entirely based on a knowledge of who made it. And there's nothing quite like that. The super prices phenomenon then leads directly into the phenomenon of faking. Because there are such differentials, inevitably art forgers are going to try to leverage that. So now, let's understand another basic foundation. As I was talking about the idea of treasure, objects that have value, but usage. We can observe this a very, 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 very long time ago. In fact, the first indication of what we can call the aesthetic impulse, the desire to make something beautiful beyond its need of function, can be observed already 150,000 years ago predating our own Homo sapiens species. Things made by what we would call Neanderthals. 
who would make these what we would call Eculean hand axes. Basically these tools, these early forms of tools that would be made by flint napping, taking a piece of flint and hitting one stone against the other until you created a sharpened tool. But for example, the central one, what we begin to notice is they produce them in these almost perfect teardrop shapes, which may not really be necessary for the function. But yet there's this desire to create that perfect symmetry of the teardrop shape. And that idea of art for use plus beauty is how most art gets made, certainly the things we talk about in art history textbooks, really, again, until the Greek Roman period in the West and the Chinese Han Dynasty in the East, where we really begin to see this kind of desire to make art for use plus beauty and to move beyond that. In fact, some of our most famous artworks were made by this basic functional concept, art for use plus beauty. This famous work, which you may know, maybe some of you have seen it in Rome, it's in the Vatican, in the St. Peter's Basilica, it's a famous work by Michelangelo, um, which is, we call it the Pietà. Uh, it was made uh, in a way that was functional. It was, most people don't realize this, it was a gravestone. It was made for a cardinal who had died and had commissioned Michelangelo to make this as his gravestone and it was meant to sit on his grave as a gravestone. But in fact, uh, in time, most people would forget that and what would matter is that it's a sculpture by Michelangelo. Now here's another example of the transition here. Uh, <laughs> he's not going to stop. <laughs> uh, so uh, this work, again, you may notice this painting by Raphael Sanzio. Uh, it's, we call it the Sistine Madonna. It's quite famous, particularly for the little uh, Putos, the, two, the little uh, angels that you see there at the bottom, they're quite memorable. You often see them referenced, um, almost more famous than the rest of the painting. It was designed to sit in a monastery of San Sisto in Piacenza. It was meant to be an altarpiece. It was meant to be part of the official church interior functional artwork to function within the church. Now, when it was finally purchased by Augustus III, the king of Saxony and Poland, uh, in 1745, for 17,000 ducats, it was a record price for that time, he had it paraded through his palace in Dresden and he would say, make way for the great Raphael. And the work had changed. No longer was it a portrait of Mary and Jesus and two saints and two angels meant to serve a contemplative service. What mattered was it was a painting by Raffaello and now it had become art as an end in itself. Where what matters is it is an artwork and what matters it was made by this master. And this happens very rarely in history. This is a really new phenomenon. And it's really only a couple hundred years old in most parts of the world. Many, most parts of the world, it's about a 200 year old phenomenon. It's not a very, so this is what I want you to understand how recent the development of the art world is. Now, these are more important distinctions that I want you guys to understand. Uh, and this is where we're getting into the contemporary day and particularly where you as uh, Belarusian artists, arts managers, uh, arts entrepreneurs, where we're going to get to a description of the contemporary art situation. And I want you to pay close attention where you can see your opportunities for you to find your own space within it. 
First of all, we can divide the art world into two categories, okay? So one is primary art market, or we often just call it contemporary art market. By primary art market, it is the same we use term, we use them in cars, in, in other sectors, houses. Primary sales are the first sale, the first time it's sold. Primary art market means art that has been painted by the painter, brought to the gallery, and the first person they sell it to, that is the primary market sale, the first time it's been sold. And this term, I didn't learn this term for a long time, secondary art market. We in Hungary, when I was learning the art market in Hungary, where I kind of learned a lot of it, we just had a cruder term, we just called it the dead art market, meaning the sale of paintings by dead people. Um, because that's what really mattered. In many ways, this should be understood. There's really, first of all, there's a secondary market that exists for artists who are very much alive. Uh, this happens in New York far more than you realize, where someone buys a painting at a gallery in Chelsea, they hold it for three years, and they take it to auction, because now we have auctions that deal in very recent contemporary artworks, and they auction it again. And that's a secondary market sale. I mean, it's being sold for the second time, or third time, or fourth time, or fifth time. But the real importance, usually, that's why when we talk about secondary market, we more often are referring to what we crudely called it in Hungary, the dead art market, because when things really change is when the artist is dead. And that's simply because a whole new dynamic enters in once the artist is dead, which is, any guesses? What's the new dynamic? What changes when the artist is dead? The rarity. The rarity, because in principle, no new works are going to be produced. And what else? The price. Yes, because the rarity. And the artist is no longer around to say, I didn't paint that. Now, this happens still. There are living artists. There are living artists who are faked in their lifetime. Uh, it happens. And sometimes even court cases where artists have said, I didn't paint that, and they have to settle like, well, actually, you, we think you did. We think you just are mad at that person and saying, okay, this happened. Generally, this is not a problem until the artist is dead, at which point then you have this new dynamic of, it's not so easy to know. And we have to do these things that, for example, this is what I do professionally in the art world. We have what we call an art forensics lab in New York where we test paintings with our scientific machinery to figure out if it's really authentically by the artist. And we do that. Um, so we have the secondary art market. We also have, again, a sector related which we call antiques. We have antique dealers. Antique dealers are also sometimes art dealers. Uh, this is often the case. So this antique dealer, as you can see, has used his walls largely for clocks. But very often you will have antique dealers who have antique furniture on the floor and paintings on the wall. So they're going to be working both markets at the same time, uh, selling a lot of different kinds of things. Now, um, here's one of the troubles that I wanted to alert you guys to that happens in the art market, and this is why I'm going to go on and show you a number of examples of problems and crises within the art world where you, as artists, as arts entrepreneurs, might be able to find your opportunity. So when I'm listing crises, I'm also trying to give you clues and indications of where you might find an opportunity within this. One is called, for example, the brown furniture market collapse. And uh, 
What was that? The brown furniture market collapse. This happened about 10 years ago. What happened? Well, about 10 years ago, and this was back when I was still, uh, actually it's probably older now, it's almost now about, almost about 18 years ago, uh, when I was still working in Budapest in the antiques business. So I was working in art and antiques, but what I was noticing was the antique furniture market was just nothing going on. Nobody was buying it. I didn't have anything to ship to the US. What had happened? Well, first of all, you have to understand this about antique furniture. And this is true for a lot of applied arts. So wealthy clients, the kind of people who can actually afford to spend $5,000 on a piece of furniture, or you know, $8,000 on a carpet, or you know, $20,000 on a chandelier, they are usually not making those decisions themselves. Just like when they buy a painting, some of them buy their own paintings, but many of them have an art advisor who helps advise them on which paintings to buy. The interior designer is essentially the art advisor for antiques purchases. So really valuable furniture doesn't usually get bought by the collector. It gets bought by their interior designer who has a very intended purpose and space and concept that it's going to fit into. So what happened? Well, I would say this is around almost now, oh, close to 20 years ago, around 2006. All of a sudden we began to notice the elite interior designers in New York, the people who had the clients who had the big money to spend, were not buying 18th and 19th century European antique furniture. The things that they had bought the Louis XV, the Louis XV, the Louis XVI, the Empire style, the Biedermeier style, the Baroque style, the Chippendale style, the George III style, even Art Nouveau style, they were not buying it anymore. And we heard them using the term brown furniture. What did they mean by brown furniture? What they meant was the furniture was brown. What that meant was they didn't care if it was walnut wood or cherry wood or mahogany wood. They didn't care if it was George III or Louis XV or Biedermeier. It was just all brown furniture and nobody likes brown furniture. Also because they associated with having a grandma look. Because they pictured grandma's house, which is, you know, all this old brown furniture stuffed together on top of each other. You couldn't really see one piece or the next because it was so many pieces kind of stuffed together. And like little lace doilies and too many tchotchkes and knickknacks and porcelain on top of it all. And they were just like, Bleh. they didn't want it. So they started to just call it brown furniture. So we call it the brown furniture market collapse. And what it taught us about the art market, and here's what I want you guys to really pay attention to, is what it taught us, first of all, there isn't actually one art market. There are thousands, tens of thousands of art markets and they are not related to each other. They are not interconnected. What I mean, for example, in a region, say the United States, there are collectors who buy French Impressionism. There are collectors who buy abstract art. There are collectors who buy early American art. They're different sectors. They aren't related. The markets are not interconnected. 
the market for mid-century abstract art is not related to the market for 19th century French Impressionist art. They're different markets. The same with every type of antique. In the United States, for example, in the city of Chicago, there might be five or six or ten collectors who really value old English 18th century furniture. Like they want an 18th century. They don't want a 19th century copy. They want the real 18th century Chippendale. They will pay for it. How many of them are there? Maybe 10. One of them dies. Their children. They don't want the Chippendale furniture. They want the money they heard mom and dad saying it was worth. So they put it on the local auction market at some local auction house. It doesn't go for nearly what they thought it was. And it gets bought up by the other nine collectors who do buy it and are getting great deals because they're getting it nice and cheap because it didn't go nearly as high as they thought it was. Now those local collectors got what they want. And the dealers who were supplying them have watched the prices go down. And once prices in the art market or any related market start to go down, they go into a death spiral. It's very hard to come back out of a downward trend in prices. And this happened to antiques. Now I'm talking like this happened like 15 years ago. And antiques have not come back. I was at the Paris flea market, I don't know, like five, six years ago. And I saw a commode, like I showed you, this kind of um, Louis XV style. Very authentic. And the dealer said, yeah, 15 years ago, I would have been asking 50,000 euros for this chest of drawers. Now, I have it at 12,000. Furniture didn't change. Just the amount of people who wanted it. So in other words, rarity is both pre predicated on the rarity of the object, but also, conversely, the number of people trying to get it. So if something is rare, but doesn't have adequate people competing for it, the price doesn't go up. You have to realize that the art market or the antiques market is sort of like a slow motion auction. We have real auctions in real time, but we also have a slow motion auction going on over time. A dealer gets feedback. I have this piece of furniture. Ooh, that interior designer wanted it. Oh, they wanted it. Oh, they wanted it. Oh, they wanted it. This is in demand. I'm going to put the price higher because I think I can get it because there's a lot of people who want it. Conversely, if there aren't people who are competing for that piece, over time the price inevitably falls. And this is what has happened to all of antique furniture. Another trend. Secondary market galleries. Galleries that deal in old paintings, paintings by dead people, have almost completely disappeared. They have almost completely disappeared. Used to be, when I started in the business, all the art galleries were galleries that specialized in paintings by old painters, hundred-year-old painters, painters who were dead, and that's where all the action was. But what happened was these guys generally got their paintings from buying them up from collectors who maybe didn't know what they had, or they went to auctions, little auctions, small auction houses, auctions in other countries, uh, and would buy up their material, take it back to their market where they knew it was worth more, and usually double the price. Generally, you have to mark it up 100% to be successful in business. Increasingly, with the internet and the internetization of auctions, 
auctions being on the internet and easily accessible to people anywhere on the globe and easily able for people who like this artist to know that an auction in New Zealand is going to have one of their paintings, you can know and you can bid on it and you can buy it. So increasingly the collectors just went around the secondary market dealers because of the basis of auctions on the internet. So now secondary market galleries have almost completely disappeared. We have, for example, in Vilnius, I'm aware of one or two. Uh, and this is normal. Almost every other gallery is going to be contemporary galleries. This is particularly which led to the biggest art scandal of recent decades in New York, which is the Nodler Gallery, New York's oldest gallery, 168-year-old gallery, who went out of business about, about, it was about now already 12 years ago. Um, there's a great movie you can watch on Netflix called Made You Look. A uh, really fun documentary about the downfall of the Nodler Gallery. And uh, it had everything to do with the fact that they were a, a secondary market gallery trying to sell old paintings by famous abstract painters like Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko. But in fact, they were all fakes. And it had everything to do with that. Now, here's another distinction let me describe another distinction in the art world that is really important and you can see this distinction everywhere those of you who've been into a lot of art galleries you'll know exactly what i'm talking about first of all the center of the global art market right now today still is today has not moved for about 20 years now more than 20 years is an area of new york we call Chelsea. Chelsea is an area of New York that previously was known by the less glamorous term meatpacking district. It was literally where they brought in the dead cows and pigs and cut them up and sent them around New York City because, you know, it takes a lot of food to feed 10 million people on an island, you know, so that is where the food came in. Anyway, originally, then it changed. It New York's art centers have moved, always driven by the same dynamic. Okay, and again, this is when you're thinking about art market, especially if you're thinking about gallery work, the one dynamic that never changes is the constant quest for cheaper rent. This is because art sales generally do not produce enough profits to pay commercial rents. Restaurants, cafes, bars, clothing stores, they are more profitable generally than art galleries. They can afford higher rents and so time and again art galleries open but they can't earn enough money to pay the rent. So what do they do? They tend to go to areas that are low rent, considered cheap, Often, to use American terms, they are ghettos. Um, and this produces the phenomenon we call in the United States gentrification, which is where a neighborhood that once was not so nice, maybe kind of dangerous, becomes cool because the artists are there and then the galleries come in and then the cool restaurants and cafes come in, and then pretty soon the developers come in and redevelop the buildings. Um, you don't have to go any farther than Ujupis. I take my students over there, you want me to explain gentrification? Text, textbook example, absolutely textbook. No different than Brooklyn or Chelsea or areas of London or every other city in the Western world has a phenomenon, but definitely like in Vilnius, Ujupis, textbook example. Um, so New York's art market has moved, its center has moved time and again, time and again in this constant quest for cheaper rents. First it was on 57th Street, close to Central Park. Then it moved down to the neighborhood we call Soho. Then Soho gentrified. And then the art galleries moved to Chelsea, which is most of these galleries are like this one. 
Most of Chelsea galleries are not even on the ground floor. They are not on the street level. They are on the third or fifth. They're basically a glorified office. They're an office which you pay $20,000 a month in rent for basically a large office that you call a gallery. Um, usually the display areas might not be much bigger than the room we're in. And then they'll have a back room, which is an office and also a small storage. Um, but here's the thing about Chelsea galleries, okay? And New York has looked and looked and looked for the next Chelsea. And for the 12 years I've been around New York, there's this constant question, where is the next Chelsea? Because we can't afford... Chelsea, like the rents are too high. We got to move somewhere else. And they, maybe it's going to be the Lower East Side. Maybe it's going to be Brooklyn. Maybe it's going to be New Jersey, but nobody can decide. But here's the feature of a Chelsea type gallery. This is a term I use in my book because it's a very real thing. A Chelsea type gallery looks like this. What do you notice about that gallery? White cube. First of all, must be white cube. Anything else? Lightning, like lightning is very empty, like not particular. Right. Everything is on the artwork, so nothing. Okay. Also, how much white wall do you see? Most of it? Yeah. And that's this weird New York dynamic which says, you know how expensive this white wall is. You know what I'm paying for it. Look how much white wall I put between that painting and that painting. What does that tell you? This painting must be really important because I gave it a lot of white wall. And this powerful dynamic of this kind of reverse snobbery uh, that goes into the Chelsea, and that's how a Chelsea type gallery functions. And this is an extremely expensive model to follow. First of all, usually it is solo shows, month-long solo exhibitions. Maybe the gallery has two, lo two spaces and so they have two artists. Or maybe occasionally, occasionally they do some kind of group show. But mostly one artist, one month, the whole gallery. If that artist isn't selling, you're in a lot of trouble. That's why they have back in the office, they have what we call the back room, which is where they have a whole bunch of examples of their other artists who they, as we would say, represent. This is a big deal. Like, to be represented by a Chelsea gallery means you have an exclusive contract with them. You do not sell your artwork yourself. You sell it through them and only through them. You don't sell it out of your studio. You don't sell it online. In fact, you don't get to keep a website anymore. You have to get rid of your website, and the only way people can reach you on the internet is through your gallery, because all sales must go through the gallery. And this is about as rare and as difficult as to become, as a basketball player, to make it into the NBA. I mean, it is that elite of a selection just to be an artist who is represented by a Chelsea gallery. Okay, there might be maybe let's say 10,000 artists in that category and that's it. Now, Chelsea type galleries exist in other very elite art centers. Uh, I would say in my own sampling here in Vilnius, I've seen about five or six galleries who function this way. Month-long solo exhibitions and the rest are going to follow a different model which I had to invent a term for it because the vast majority of galleries in the United States, anywhere outside of New York, function like this. Even in bigger cities like Denver, Santa Fe, New Mexico, which has a huge art scene, they function like this. What do you notice? What's different here? Direct light. Direct light. Paintings. Yep. Various artists. Various artists, yeah. And with the style of hanging, we would call it, we have an expression, salon style hanging. 
In other words, you hang like the salon. In other words, you don't leave a lot of white wall because it's expensive. So you try to squeeze in paintings everywhere. And certain artists has like one artist you can see, he's got the right corner. And on the left side of that corner, you've got a different artist. And each artist might have a corner. They might be able to squeeze in five, six, eight paintings. That, but we don't have solo shows. Basically, a painting moves when it's sold. That's when it moves. It moves when it's sold. And the regional gallery model is far less expensive, but it also, like I said, um, here, for example, one of the most famous art centers in the United States, Santa Fe, New Mexico, still all the galleries there function essentially like regional galleries. Maybe a little more spaced out. They hang on a line. They don't quite do it so densely salon style. But they do have a mix of six or seven artists at the same time in the spaces. Mixed in with other things. Furniture. Ceramics. Other things for sale. And so that begins to create a totally different system. And that's why I call it a regional gallery because they very often are selling the region. The art is local. It is about the local place. And the clients are different. Chelsea type gallery, your clients are the rich New York art collectors. They're not going to come back next month if you have the same stuff you had last month. They want to see something new. Regional gallery, who are your clients? Tourists. They're coming in once. They're not going to come back again because they don't live here. So you need to show them everything right now, today, right now. Hence the regional gallery. And they're selling usually artwork characteristic of the region. Now, um, what also is going on? Uh, many of our art galleries that are trying to form their own outposts in these emerging areas like Brooklyn, this was a gallery in Bushwick. They closed down because when you try to go to these outer regions that were a ghetto because you've got to go for the cheaper rent, it can work for a while. But you know what? The recipe for gentrification is known by everyone. So a gallery moves out to a place because it's cheap. The developers are watching. And before you can make a success of your gallery, the developers have already raised the rents around you and all of a sudden, the development moves faster than you can. Also, the art fairs. Let's talk about the art fairs. Um, hold on, I have some stuff on art fairs right here. So art fairs really began with uh, especially this famous event in New York called the 1913 Armory Show. Before then, we had salons, we had secessions. The Paris Salon was the big art exhibition event in Paris. Every European city had a version of the Paris Salon. You would bring your art to the jury. The jury would be very conservative. The more modernist artists would be rejected. And then they would form secessions to try to get their own art in. And all of this would go on. The Armory Show was essentially New York's attempt at a secession. But what it did was it dragged America kicking and screaming into a confrontation with modern art and began a process that seemed very unlikely at the time. But in fact, within about 30 or 40 years from this event in 1913, New York would be close to becoming the center of the global art market. It would complete the process by the 1980s when the big auction houses, Sotheby's and Christie's, would make New York their headquarters. And by that point, New York was cemented as the center of the global art world. And for th from that time to today, it still is, with no real rivals at all. But what we did start to see are art fairs. And the Armory was really the first art fair, because unlike the previous salons and secessions, where artists just brought their things into the jury and the, the, new, the Armory Show began to employ dealers to bring the artwork. So it was the dealers who brought the artwork, this intermediary, and that gets taken to its full completion by Art Basel holding its first art fair in 1970. Now, what's different about these art fairs, they become the modern version of the salon. Uh, they are, what is different, however, 
is the old salon in the Paris model, it was a jury of artists who juried artworks from other artists. Now in the Art Basel model, it is a jury of art dealers who are jurying art dealers. You are admitted to Art Basel as an art dealer, as your gallery. They decide is your gallery good enough to show at Art Basel and then if you do you have the honor of paying approximately 100 to 200,000 euros for a four-day event. Now if you guys have been to Art Vilnius, they try to operate basically on the same model, a four-day event, it's galleries who are there generally though sometimes there's always some artists but the basic principle is galleries rent stands and you and this became the system of the art fairs including in New York they borrowed the name from the famous 1913 show and now New York's main art fair is still called the armory show leading to some confusion because it doesn't happen in an armory um, and it's not the famous one in 1913 but the this expression, Armory Show, is so famous in New York, they use it, that's the name of the big New York art fair. The biggest one in the world is actually Art Basel, after the one they put in Switzerland in Basel, they opened one in Miami uh, in around 2000, and the one in Miami is now bigger than the one in Basel. In fact, many people think that Art Basel art fair is in Miami, not realizing that there, there is one in Switzerland. It happens at a different time. We have the main London Art Fair, the Freeze Art Fair, and we also have, this is important, if anywhere you have a big art fair, Art Basel, Miami Beach, uh, Freeze, anywhere, you're gonna have what we call satellite fairs. And this is important, again, for you guys trying to crack into the art world. Um, you're going to make your start at a satellite fair. So anytime Art Basel happens in, Art, in Basel, uh, Switzerland, which happens in June usually, there will be like five to six satellite fairs happening at the same time on the same four days, but they'll be using other buildings, an old post office, an old train station, some warehouse on the edge of town, and they will be where the up and coming galleries, the ones who can't afford to get into Basel, who aren't famous enough to get into Basel, this is where they're gonna go. And Volta's one of those, but there are many, what we call satellite fairs. We also have TFAF, which is the main fair for old stuff, for really valuable antiques, really valuable, like if you're gonna buy a painting by Archimboldo, you'd buy it at TFAF, if not at an auction house. And then we have what's often called the Olympics of the art world, the Venice Biennial. And it starts this term, biennial, which means every two years. It originally was just another international salon, like the Paris Salon, a place to sell paintings. Just it happened in Venice every two years. But it changed in the 1960s and became non-commercial and directed by one curator. And then we still have each nation has, if you've gone to art, to Venice Biennial, there are all these pavilions that were built by the countries that existed in the 1920s, like the United States, Germany, France, Japan, and they all have built pavilions around the Giardini. Countries that didn't have the chance at that time, like Lithuania, have to find like an old church or a monastery that they rent so that they can use it. But it really is a lot like the Olympics. Like every country sends their national champion to make their best art thing, and they literally give gold medals. But it's non-commercial. The stuff is not for sale which is why it's very conceptual installation. Like the one thing you won't see at the Venice Biennial are paintings. Then other cities, Istanbul, Shanghai, Sao Paulo, they all follow it. Uh, there's the one called Manifesta, and probably the most famous, also a bit like the Olympics of the art world, is called Documenta, which happens only every five years in the city of Kassel, Germany. It was founded by this guy, Arnold Boda, who wanted to create something that was like a version of the what they called in the Nazi period Antarctica Kunst, in other words, um, degenerate art, which was this famous exhibition the Nazis had of all the modernists and cubists that they thought were horrible and ridiculous, but in fact became quite famous. And so he tried to, the first one was to recreate that, to recreate all of this degenerate art, and then they decided to keep doing it every five years. Um, so for the last, again, every five years we've still been having this documenta and it is always curated by one curator.
So um, that is the end of my slideshow. And I wanted to give you guys a sense of some crises that are going on in the art world, both the art fairs, the auctions, uh, the gallery system, so that we can try to get a idea of where you can make your cracks in, in fact, a very hierarchical art world, but one which, in fact, can be broken into. So does anyone have any questions or comments they would like to bring up? You can check questions online. Yeah. So my question is, where does useless and not needed anymore art go? Um, in other words, where does the art die? <laughs> okay, so this is the sad fact about art, which is, you know, people often ask about it as an investment opportunity. And what I usually have to explain to most people is most art will not increase in value, it will decline in value. And uh, this will happen like with the art that your grandparents bought from a friend of theirs who was an artist and they liked it and they bought it and they paid some money for it. And now when they passed away, nobody remembers the artist and they don't. So the general answer is it goes to thrift shops, to, you know, uh, the sort of used household good shops where it, it ends up. Um, and there's always smart dealers who go and poke through that stuff looking for things that have been misidentified or failed to notice somebody's good artwork. And, and they do uh, find them. But it generally goes to thrift shops or uh, it gets bought up by working artists who want to use the canvas again. Um, and uh, it gets bought by art forgers who want it for the canvas because to make a good forgery, you need an old canvas and you need an old stretcher. And so they buy these things for that purpose. But uh, overall, um, yeah, I mean, I think we're going to, because especially the last three, four, five decades have been extremely productive. We haven't had so many wars, so a lot of the art has survived, and now we're just, we, we've got a lot of art. Um, but, you know, it can be taken to, uh, as I said, it can be taken to auction, but the auctions that carry, you know, older artworks, they need to identify the artist, they need to know who it is to be able to talk it up, to make some interest on it, or otherwise, yeah, there, there aren't a lot of places for it to go. So, is it actually possible to start from thrift shops? They already are. They already are. For the smart people, for the smart collectors. And, and I really, um, overall, again, if I'm talking about opportunities for people, I think there is the best opportunities are at the lowest levels to start. Um, and especially sort of, let's say, multi-level profiling. So thrift shops are great for, for clothes, for um, all manner of applied arts. And if you start out being just a basic thrift shop, but then you start developing a selective line where you really kind of curate out the stuff that's good. Uh, and it doesn't have to be super valuable, but it's like things that you got given because they just wanted to give it away. Okay, or you acquired it for one euro. But if you fix it and clean it up, you can charge 15 euros for it, okay? That's the kind of stuff that you can start with, whether it's lamps or toasters or ceramics, clothing. But then, really, it's a way to get you access to people's junk. Because if you have the eye, and it doesn't mean that it has to be canonical and famous. It may just have to have a good look and to recognize the look. I've noticed this a lot in the Paris flea market, that people weren't obsessed with names anymore. They were just obsessed with the look of things. If it had the right look, if you have a look, then you can really start to create the uh, aesthetic of the pieces, which you can acquire super cheap to free, and you can mark them up modest amounts. But you're also trying to get yourself the opportunity and your chance 
to find the really valuable stuff. But you can only find the really valuable stuff if you go through all the a little bit valuable stuff, things that you can mark up a little bit and keep it going so that you have the opportunities to spot the things that are really, really valuable and to be able to make something from them. Uh, what about performance art? How does it work in the prism of uh, the art market? Well, it's always a challenge. Perform performance art it w was intended always from its beginnings, you know, especially when it really took off in the 1960s, to be a challenge to the object-based art market, which, if it isn't clear, the art market is inherently based in objects and unique objects. And performance is everything that is not. But at the same time, it did become part of the art market. So in time, like other, let's say, ephemeral or infinitely reproducible forms, it finds a way to give itself a uniqueness. And that usually happens through what we call, um, we often will call it like a certificate of authenticity or a certificate of ownership. So there's cases where an artist creates a performance piece. They write it out, they script it, they sort of describe it, their gallery who lets them perform it. Then they create a certificate of authenticity, kind of a copyright to that performance, which can then be bought and sold. So the rights to produce that performance piece again can be sold. Now that's not always the intention of performance artists. Many performance artists are averse to the very idea of a market, but if they want to be able to market, to sell their performances, it's usually in these concepts. Like there's um, an artist named Sol LeWitt, and he would, he didn't do the artwork, he sold a set of designs and instructions for how to paint the walls according to his instructions. And then you purchase the right to those designs and then you did the artwork. So usually it's done through this, through the sale of the, the sort of certificate of authenticity. Could you please expand on Belarusian artists taking a prominent place uh, in the world uh, art market? So here's where I feel like there's a lot of opportunity for Belarusian artists. First of all, um, I think I talked about it with a number of people, uh, especially artists of Belarusian background. Uh, obviously, y you have a certain degree of like political crisis, uh, especially for those living abroad. But at the same time, you don't want to be defined by that. You don't want to just be like, okay, well, we suffer, so that's us. And that kind of pigeonholes you in a way that doesn't, uh, I don't know, it's kind of limiting. So I would say when it comes for making your way abroad, I think you, you have to walk a fine line between being like, okay, we're, you know, we've had to leave our homeland and that's unfortunate, but at the same time, we're more than that. But at the same time, it is part of my identity. And it is part of what I am, which is I am now cosmopolitan. I am a citizen of the world. I am a producer of art independent of my homeland or roots because I've been kind of disconnected to, from them. And so I would say for them to make their way in the art world on a global level, what I think is best right now is to work on creating galleries and spaces in cities that have a large diaspora, whether that's like Warsaw or Berlin or here in Vilnius, and to create a gallery that really does cater to artists from Belarus, but artists who really move beyond those kind of narrow interpretations and show a broader inflection of what it means to be an artist from Belarus. And so I think in general, the first step is to create a kind of branding of what it means to be an artist from Belarus. Something that people can catch on to, but something which is not limiting.
Uh, so I think those are, are the first steps, is to create a sort of a branding and identity that can extend beyond a single artist but can be acquired by multiple. And that might be creating kind of a grouping or a, a kind of a movement. Uh, and and that, that's really one of the first steps towards creating that branding. Do you know any contemporary Belarusian artists? What do you think about Belarusian art in general? Is there any chance that its value will increase because it's rare? <laughs> yes, I know a lot of them. They're my colleagues at European Humanities University, and many of them are excellent. And I, I do think that there is something, there is a value in it. And I think what is most important is, like I said, to create this identity and this branding through cohesive exhibitions and creating those possibilities. So I would say, overall, you just really want to create um, the, the concept of what it means to be an artist from Belarus. And I can't say what that should be, but I think that the more artists show together in groupings as collectives, uh, giving themselves collective identities. These are how that would be made. And then because of, as we said, the rarity, this can then really lead towards a market appreciation. It's nice to hear about the bits and bolts of the art market. Uh, do you know any prominent examples of Belarusian artists being integrated and becoming blue chip artists? Tough question. Um... Uh, <laughs> my, my answers, uh, uh, um, would be, um, not for a long time, like Marc Chagall, um, uh, artists of his generation, uh, artists who worked in the school in Vitebsk, uh, but in recent years, I wouldn't say I know of any who have become blue chip now, but blue chip is such an ugly term, um, it's, but it's a real term, I can't deny it. People use it, people say it. Um, but again, that's why I'm saying I think the opportunity is there. Uh, I think I've seen it happen with other artists from Eastern Europe, whether it's Romanians or um, uh, Czech artists. Uh, I, I've definitely seen them rise to those levels, and that's why I'm saying it is entirely possible because the New York art world is still very international. Okay, so it might be elitist, it might be difficult to break in, but it does not exclude people on nationality. Could you please comment on the center versus periphery in the art world? Where does the path from periphery go to the center? The path from the periphery to the center is always a difficult one to navigate. Um, generally, right now, it goes through art fairs. Okay, that's, so far, that's, that's really been the primary route. Uh, particularly for artists from Eastern Europe that has tended to be the art fairs that are in the West but on the edge. That's usually um, Art Berlin and uh, uh, Vienna Art Fair. Okay, so Vienna especially has generally been the art fair where you've seen the galleries from parts of Eastern Europe breaking into the Western mindset. So I would say the periphery to the center lies there. Then there's the alternative route where you're not dealing in commercially sellable products. And then that tends to lie in the international world of biennials and documentas, which of course are hard to break into, but there are events that are happening all the time, for example, here in Lithuania that are occurring and giving opportunities to artists to be seen and to be known. And, and that's where you're going to find the routes from periphery to the center. Uh, but, you know, we're working on other ways. So I'm literally going to run over and make a pitch for an app 
to do art reviews because I realized that art reviews are going to be the primary pathway to that. That's going to be important. Thank you. There's one more. How do cases of contractual sale of art for business money laundering affect the contemporary art market? Horrifically. Incalculable. Um, in the New York art market, now it doesn't happen in Vilnius, like, you, you, I mean, Vilnius paintings sell for like 10,000 euros and that's like, whoo, big money, like you're not going to launder anything at 10,000 euros. In New York, it so corrupts the art market, we can't tell what's real art exchanges and what's money laundering. It's so vast. It occurs both in the operation of galleries and in the sale of artworks. Um, you know, I watch TV shows like Ozark and Breaking Bad, and they spend so much time trying to figure out how to money launder. And I just keep thinking, man, you guys should go to the art market because it's really easy because that's like all that's going on. Um, so, I mean, really, it's like in New York, we suspect maybe a third, to maybe 40% of the galleries are not real galleries. Um, they are not making their money selling paintings and paying their rent and paying their employees from selling paintings. They are laundering drug money. They are laundering gambling money. They are laundering stolen government money. Uh, and maybe 40% of them. And that's what's really hard to run a gallery in New York because you have to compete against those people and they're not really trying to make a profit by the rules. At the same time, you know, sales of art as well are, it's just too easy to launder money. So it throws off everything and we're never really sure what's a real sale as compared to what's money laundering. But it tends to happen at the elite levels, like the New York level, where it's like $100,000, $500,000. Then that's like the amount of money people want to money launder. I remember I used to joke in Colorado, nobody laundered money in Colorado. It's just like, when you're going to launder something for like $5,000, like it's not worth the trouble. So, um, yeah, that's, but it, money laundering's huge, huge. Uh, could you please give an example of a good collective national branding that Belarusian artists can rely on? Yeah, there was one that occurred um, in Romania around the city of Cluj, Kolosvar to Hungarians, um, second city in Romania. They called it literally the Cluj School, and it was um, uh, a lot of artists from Romania and surrounding areas who all kind of had this very expressionistic and like, okay, very Romanian, like, ooh, trauma, like, okay, kind of look, but it worked. Um, uh, and so some of, these, some of these artists became really, really quite, you know, sought after. Um, so, uh, yeah, have a look at the so-called Cluj School, um, C-L-U-J, uh, uh, in Romania. It's a really good example of how a group of artists were able to build a branding for themselves and a style and, and something that then allowed them to uh, uh, transcend, you know, just their local market. Do you think that an artist should describe themselves as Belarusian or Ukrainian or whatever first in order to be recognized as world-level artist? It doesn't hurt, okay? Ultimately, you just want to be known as an artist. Like, again, you know, if you think of someone like Marc Chagall, few people know of him as an... They, most people don't know he's from Belarus, technically. Like, they know, like, maybe he's from somewhere in the East, like Russia, or we don't know. Or, but he was in Paris, and whatever, they don't know. And, and ultimately, you, you, you do want to transcend your, um, your national origins. There's also a, a, a feature of the art market, the gravity of your origins, which is 99% of artists never escape them. Even really, really famous artists. Chagall did. Whereas, like, he's more valuable in America than in Belarus. In other words, Americans will pay more money. Uh, Van Gogh, Americans, British, Japanese will pay more for Vincent Van Gogh than Dutch people. But they're really the exception. Even really famous artists like Anders Zorn, who's one of the great Swedish painters, it's still Swedish people who buy him. Uh, Max Lieberman, one of the greatest German painters, it's Germans who buy him. And most artists cannot escape the gravity of their origins. In other words, they will be sucked back to their home country because their home country values them more than any foreign collectors do. Um, and it's really a small number who escape that. So you do want to escape that. You, you want to be an artist where the international market pays more for you 
than your homeland followers will. Um, but it's a, it's a hard thing to escape. Uh, it's, it's, it requires uh, really entering the international canon. And in connection, there is one more question. Yeah. Questions keep coming. Uh, besides collective national branding, could you please suggest any ways uh, for Belarusian artists to become recognized worldwide? And how does this collective country branding work with cancelling of Russian Belarusian due to war in Ukraine? Um, I think it works in your favor. Again, it's, it's a question of how much you want to play up like your own suffering, uh, you know, your, your issues as being sort of an exiled artist, kind of a refugee artist, sort of like that. Um, how much you want to play that identity or you don't want to play that identity. But the best thing to keep doing is, first of all, try to have exhibitions, starting right here, right now. Work on creating spaces and opportunities to have exhibitions and to get those shows up and to get those opportunities because until you show, you're not going to get the next stage. So I would say keep trying at that level and then continue to work on having exhibitions in uh, more international settings and keep trying improvised settings, keep trying alternative exhibition possibilities, keep trying other ways that you can do this that will attract attention, not just in the artworks, but how you show it. Okay. All right, well, thank you. Okay, thank you so much for thank your expertise you. and uh, for your insights and for the advice to the Belarusian uh, artists. You. Thank you. Thank you to the guests, to the uh, participants online and here. Uh, yeah, thank you guys video. online. Yeah, keep inspired, keep curious, and keep making the, an impact. Yeah, the yeah, let's keep going. Let's, let's put on some really good shows of Belarusian artists in this next year. I think that's the number one task. So. Let's, let's all talk about it and keep talking about it and try to put on some cool shows. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Yeah, thank you guys. Bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.